All right, so we are in our last week of looking at the book of Ruth, and we're going to get to a really fascinating aspect of this. So I'm going to tell you now that today and tomorrow we're going to look at the <clears throat> final passages in the book of Ruth. But then on the third day, we're going to talk about this whole kinsman redeemer aspect of it and why it was so important. And, and what does that have to do with us today? This is a very important part of it. But before we get too far into that, we got to finish up the book of Ruth. So if you remember last week, we got all the way to verse 8 of chapter 4 when Boaz and his shrewdness had uh, gotten so-and-so, old so-and-so, good old so-and-so, to agree uh, to give Boaz the land. So not only that, but Boaz also had to marry Ruth. Okay, so that's where we're at. So in verse 9 of chapter 4 in the book of Ruth, and then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Limelech, Kilion, and Malan. And I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malan's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today you are witnesses. And then the elders and all the people at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. <laughs> Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Now this is a really weird last sentence. <clears throat> You say, no, why? Why is this so weird? I mean, you're just talking about family line. Okay, well, for that, we got to skip all the way back to Genesis chapter 38 when we get the story of Judah and Tamar. Now, remember, in the Old Testament, we look at these patriarchs as, as great men, and we think about Abraham and Isaac and, and Joseph and all that stuff. In the middle of the uh, accounting of Joseph, we get Genesis chapter 38, which is an accounting of Judah, one of Joseph's brothers. Remember the tribe of Judah. So this is one of the patriarchs, one of the, the 12 tribes. Okay, So here is the story of our upstanding patriarch. <clears throat> At that time, Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a man of Adullam named Hira. And there Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. He married her, made love to her, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son whose name was Ur. She conceived again and gave birth to a son and named him Onan. And she gave birth still to another son and named him Shelah. It was at Kazib that she gave birth to him. Okay, so we got all these names of the kids. So what does this have to do anything? Ah, this is that kinsman redeemer thing coming back again. Okay, so Judah got a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and named, her name was Tamar. But Ur... Judah's firstborn was wicked in the Lord's sight, and so the Lord put him to death. Okay, so now Tamar is a widow. Remember the rule of the kinsman redeemer. The next family member has to step up and marry her. And at that, when they have kids with her, then now that becomes the lineage of Ur. So this is to keep Ur's lineage going. Okay, so verse 8. Then Judah said to Onan, Sleep with your brother's wife and fulfill your duty to her as a brother-in-law to raise up offspring for your brother, kinsman redeemer. But Onan knew that the child would not be his. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he spilled his semen on the ground to keep from providing offspring for his brother. What he did was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death also. Okay, so now we have Ur that's dead, and we now have Onan who was not willing to do what Boaz has done, and as a result of it, God killed him. So two sons are down. So Judah then said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, Live as a widow in your father's household until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought, well, he might die too, just like his brothers. And so Tamar went to live in her father's household. So here's Tamar, who's a widow, twice now. Okay, And so Judah has said, hey, listen, you know what? Whenever, uh, whenever my youngest son grows up, you can marry him. Well, that's not exactly what happened. See, after a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. And when Judah recovered from his grief, he went up to Tinma, to the men who were shearing his sheep. And his friend Hira the Adulamite went with him. Now, here's the thing. Tamar was told, your father-in-law is on his way to Tinma to shear his sheep. She took off her widow's clothes and covered herself in a veil to disguise herself and then sat down like she was a prostitute. 
Okay, for she saw that no that though Selah had grown up, she had not been given to him as a wife. So when Judah saw her on the side of the road, she thought she was a prostitute, for she covered her face, not realizing, realizing that she was his daughter-in-law, went over by the roadside and said, Come now, come sleep with me. Uh, and what will you give me if I sleep with you, she asked. I'll send you a young goat from my flock. Will you give me something as a pledge until you send it, she said. Uh, what should I give you? How about your seal and its cord and staff in your hand? So he gave them to her and, she, and, he, and slept with her, and she became pregnant. And then Tamar did sneaky, and she took off her veil and put on her widow's clothes again. <clears throat> so then, rumor has it that Tamar is pregnant, and Judah becomes very upset. Uh, you know, after all, you know, she's supposed to be a widow. So Judah says, bring her out and have her burned to death. And Tamar's response was, I'm pregnant by the man who owns these. See if you recognize the seal and the cord and the staff these are. And Judah recognized them and said, She's more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her my son, Shela. What a weird compliment that these people have given Boaz. Why did they give this compliment? And I know we're past our five minutes, but this is unusual. Why would they do that? You see, ultimately what they're saying is, is that we want you to be blessed much like the line of Perez was blessed in spite of the shortcomings that were given. In spite of the shortcomings of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malan, we want your line to be blessed much like Perez was blessed in spite of Judah's treachery and Judah's conniving. So these people are offering this great blessing to Boaz because of Boaz's willingness to step up and do the right thing. And it's really ironic that they talked about Judah and his unwillingness to do it. Basically, what they're saying is, Boaz, you're a far better man than your predecessor. All right, tomorrow we're going to close. Well, not tomorrow. We're not going to. We're going to finish reading through the book of Ruth, but we're not quite done with Ruth.